Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we are returning to War in the Pacific Admirals Edition, our Let's Play series against Evoken now. Uh, it is May 11th of 1942, and the war is beginning to get to the point where I feel like we can challenge the Japanese advances. Uh, and uh, this is going to be a pretty interesting turn. First off, it starts off with the Navy V getting uh, torpedoed off Savi, which is not great. Um... One torpedo hit, heavy damage. That'll probably sink. That's basically a uh, a destroyer, uh, but for it, it, it offers aviation support for like patrol float planes and things like that. They tend to be a little bit vulnerable in some of those distant islands where you put them because they they're going to give you aviation support in remote places. Um, but it it is um, you know it's still basically like on a destroyer hull, so it's unfortunate to lose one there probably. Meanwhile, the destroyer Jupiter here, a British, I believe this is a Royal Navy destroyer, the Jupiter, but I could be wrong on that. Dropping depth charges here near Lasan Island against a Japanese sub. And it looks like it claimed 10 hits there. Nothing, no major indication of heavy damage there, but at the very least, maybe we did some, some moderate damage that'll require the sub to return to port. And now we're into the air recon phase here. So that's the end of the night operational phase. And let's see what happens in the daytime hours. Now, you may remember uh, we were oh, 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 oh. so we were we were trying to sneak a convoy of like 10 AKLs, which are basically coastal merchant ships. They're all under, I want to say, 4000 tons. So these are small merchants. They carry 1700 cargo with them, but we had brought them down from Calcutta. They're basically intercoastal merchants and we had brought them down from Calcutta. Last turn, we spotted a Japanese task force of three ships, including one light cruiser and two destroyers heading to... We, we didn't know what direction they were heading. We suspected perhaps Rangoon, but we had hoped that maybe they would turn around because we got a good detection on them. They also got a good detection on us, however. Now there are two Japanese destroyers ravaging a cargo task force, a, a convoy, on the way in with no escort. We have no warships in this task force and so they're getting they're getting chewed up something fierce here we'll go ahead and fast forward through the actual replay oh boy yeah they'll probably burn through most of their ammo here but the two japanese destroyers sank or badly damaged one two three four five six seven eight akls are all either sunk or have very heavy damage and will likely sink one has moderate damage and on fire, and three are undamaged. Actually, two are on fire, and three are undamaged. They are in the Rangoon port, however, so hopefully they don't retreat out of there and we can just dock them up alongside the quay and uh, and unload the, the supplies that made it through. Getting supplies into Burma is really important. Uh, AKLs are not very valuable. They've got like a one victory point value, which is the same as like a fighter plane. Um, but, uh, but nonetheless, it's not a great result. We now have a big dogfight going on, however. It looks like the Japanese extended their combat air patrol over that task force uh, so that we couldn't bomb their destroyers. But as a result, now we've got like a 30-plane dogfight here on the Japanese side with well over 20 of our own, actually over 30, over 40 of our own fighters. About 30 of them are P-40Es and Kitty Hawk 1s, which are P-40s. Uh, we've got about 10 Hurricane Truck 2s and 3 P-38 Lightnings. We've also got a bombing raid going in with PBY-5 Catalinas. And so we'll see how this plays out. So a lot of, a lot of action here on the Kitty Hawks. Now, we don't have as many P-38s up because our fatigue level after, after we provided long-range cap over those transports to prevent any Japanese bombing raid coming against them last turn and as a result our hurricanes and our lightnings fatigue was over 20 which basically means if i tried to send the bulk of them into combat they'd get shredded so i lowered their combat air patrol percentage of the squadron to something that would be more sustainable um i think it's in the 30 to 40 percent of the squadron flying with the rest of the guys resting and then i brought in like 32 kitty hawk ones from india to bring in some fresh pilots uh, who'd be able to fight against the Japanese here. It's the Mofo and Catalina wine mixer. <laughs> Don't know what that means, but okay. All right, let's go ahead and fast forward through the rest of this dogfight. Catalina's made it through unscathed. 
And all their bombs missed. Well, I'm kind of disappointed they weren't carrying torpedoes. Although I don't know if those were the Catalinas based at Rangoon or not. Because our, our Catalinas at Rangoon have torpedoes. If those were based further out, they probably would have been carrying bombs. We do have torpedoes in supply at Rangoon. Our headquarters does have over 100 torpedoes in stock. Um, so let's see. this. The way this thing played out, we flew 10 Hurricanes, 19 or 29 Kitty Hawks, uh, 14 Warhawks, and 3 Catalinas. So all told... What is that? 43 P-40 variants. The Japanese lost three zeros and four Oscars. We lost one Hurricane and one Kitty Hawk. That's a pretty damn good ratio there. Seven to two against presumably experienced Japanese pilots. We know these zeros are from Hosho 1. They've been placed up on a land base, so they're not on the carrier right now. I don't know what the quality of their air crews are, but I assume these are better pilots, that this isn't a training squadron. Usually you don't put your trainees on the front line so that's a very good result for P-40, primarily P-40s versus highly maneuverable Japanese fighters. I will take 7-2 to two every day of the week. We'll see if we get any other bombing raids here. We did also send some Vindicators out as well, a very small squadron of Vindicators. Whoa! We got one hit. They were a very low experience squadron there. It looks like they dropped 1,000-pound bombs, and they put 1,000-pounder into a Japanese destroyer here, into the Hatsumiya. Uh, and it is on fire. A thousand pounder into a destroyer will do quite a bit of damage and certainly will require her to return to port um, and, uh, and, and spend some time in the yard. I don't know if we'll sink her, but she's at least taken some damage that's not on fire. Looks like the Japanese combat air patrol had been totally swept clean in that previous raid, so there was no one up there to defend against the bombers, and so the Vindicators came in unopposed, and I think hitting a maneuvering destroyer with a obsolete dive bomber uh, is, a, is a pretty good success there. Meanwhile, we've got some Japanese bombing going on in the Philippines, as to be expected. They're hitting our troops near Clark Field. Strategic bombers are also hitting the base at Nanning in China. Which I don't think there's any way we can hold Nanning, so maybe that's an indication he's going to go for it. Maybe that's just a training squadron. A lot of Japanese players use uh, China as a sort of a train near base. 8B-17s are coming in on the Japanese destroyers. They're coming in at a thousand feet. They're skip level bomb. They're skip bombing, and no hits. These are very low experience B-17 crews from India, which were flying out of Chittagong up here. Uh, they came in at a thousand feet. Perhaps they should have come in lower. Uh, they dropped four 500 pounders each. And so that was a waste of 32 500 pound bombs. No hits there against the Japanese. All right, so another AKL sank there. We just got the little of them drowning. Looks like there may also have been Japanese recon planes over a couple of other convoys we have in the Bay of Bengal, so we'll have to take a look at that. Uh, we, are, we have two more convoys we were going to try and sneak in. I'm assuming the Japanese destroyers will pull back after this turn and take at least one turn to rearm, but I don't know that I'll be in, in Rangoon in the next turn, so it may be, may be foolish to try and press those home unless we want to lose more AKLs. Meanwhile, we've got another raid of Vindicators coming in. I believe we've moved to the PM phase, so this squadron is launching another attack. And the Japanese have a second group of aircraft up in combat air patrol. This time we've got more of our advanced fighters, 10 P-38 Lightnings, again 10 Hurricanes, and then the rest are Kitty Hawks or P-40s. Uh, but again, against about 20 Japanese fighters who are escorting or, or providing combat air patrol for these two destroyers. Frankly, two destroyers are not worth 40 Japanese aircraft. They're not. Um, and it looks like they've got about 40 on cap. So, you know, a destroyer is about six, at least in game terms, a destroyer is worth like six or seven victory points, maybe a little bit more, um, and a fighter is worth one. And while that, that may seem a little skewed to me, I think when you factor in the pilot factor, um, it makes more sense, especially from the Japanese point of view when they have some serious limitations in terms of how many pilots they, they have that are, are good. You can see we're destroying a number of zeros as well. This battle appears to be going just as well. We are taking some damage. The other nice thing to consider is that all of these air battles are occurring over Rangoon, which is a friendly base. So if our aircraft are damaged or destroyed, the pilots can bail out and be rescued. If the Japanese are shot down here, I suppose possibly their destroyer could rescue them, maybe. But most likely the vast majority of these Japanese air crews are going to become either 
prisoners of war missing in action or KIA if they are aircraft destroyed. Yeah, the other thing in ours, I agree with you, is that to me, like, Japan doesn't have that many destroyers, and every destroyer they lose is a destroyer that could be doing convoy escorts, anti-submarine patrols, could be doing, like, Tokyo Express raid or, or uh, actions where it's sneaking in troops or supplies to various bases. The destroyers are really the workhorses of the Japanese fleet, and they have some unique abilities around, like, troop transport and supply transport that are reflecting the... Uh, way that things occurred at Guadalcanal, and so they have a tremendous amount of value in my opinion, and, and that certainly would make them worth more, I think, than any kind of actual victory point calculation as well. Some of the older obsolete ones, maybe not so much, but... All right, we're going to fast forward through this air battle. It looks like all the Vindicators made it through, dropping their payloads. We got another 1,000-pounder in the into the... was it? The Hashu... Hachu Ar Hachu Aru? I'm not sure. A thousand pounder into her. Heavy fires. So I believe that was the same destroyer we hit in the last raid. So two thousand pounders perhaps into her. Badly damaged, heavy fires. I gotta imagine at the very least the Japanese are gonna have to bring additional destroyers up to support any additional attempts to shut down Rangoon, at least by sea. Meanwhile, no air losses in that attack, and the Japanese lost another six fighter aircraft. Very good results for us so far. And we've got another raid approaching. Seven more B-17s going after the Japanese. Four zeros are providing cover. We're going to fast forward through that. All seven B-17s made it through. You can see the Japanese destroyer is on fire. But the B-17s didn't hit them anything. So we did shoot down another zero without loss. Japanese destroyer is confirmed on fire. We've got another raid coming in. This one with one Catalina. She's coming in. And she puts a 500 pounder into the Japanese destroyer. So I believe that's three bombs into this destroyer. Heavy fires. Heavy damage now. Um, hopefully she's a goner. We'll see. They were dropping 500 pounders from 1,000 feet. And one of their two bombs went into her. Three bombs into a destroyer. Two of them larger. Assuming that that's not fog of war, because sometimes you get bad reports. Those were those are tremendous results for us. Japanese destroyer firing, or Japanese submarine firing at one of our destroyers here off Colombo. It missed. Launch some depth charges, but don't appear to do any damage. Japanese bombardment attack at Batavia. Just really trying to harass our troops and slowly wear them down. No real attempt to uh, overwhelm them yet. Pretty heavy casualties for a bombardment attack, though. They've definitely shifted into using their infantry units' artillery as well. Bombardment attack at Clark Field. Um, I don't know, Anaris. I think the game accounts for over-penetration, but I'm not sure if that counts for, like, contact aerial bombs. It was an SAP bomb, so it was semi-armor semi piercing. Okay, it looks like Calcutta's airfield expanded, so we should be able to operate heavier bombers out of there without any problems. But that looks like it's going to do it for the turn. So we'll want to take a look at the combat reports. Again, what we were looking at in those those reports that you see sort of in real time, if you will, as the as the battles unfold, fog of war is baked into that. So we don't know for sure that we hit all of those things. We don't know for sure that we uh, shot down that number of aircraft. We'll take a look at the post battle report. That could also be influenced by fog of war as well. Uh, but we'll take a look at it here in a second. All right. It's always a good sign when your opponent's save file is that hurt. All right. Let's go ahead and take a look here. Aircraft losses. Woo -wee. If that's if that's true, and I don't think those numbers are as high as they're suggesting, but if that's true, that was a decisive victory for us that turn. 
23 zeros lost, 21 of them in air-to-air combat, 2 operationally, 17 Oscars, 12 in air-to-air combat, 5 operational. I'm not sure where the three GM1 Bettys were lost. Maybe they were on recon missions over convoys that shot them down. We did claim we lost three Kitty Hawks, one in air-to-air, two operational, one Catalina in an operational loss, one P-38 in an operational loss, one Kitty Hawk and one Hurricane in air-to-air combat. So all told, that's what? Two, three... Six fighters for the cost of over 40 Japanese aircraft. That is uh, that is a damn good turn. 41 total aircraft lost today's versus seven for us. That's going to be a bad day for, for the Japanese uh, pilots. If we take a look at the pilot losses, we didn't even lose a pilot. Two pilots were wounded in action. No one is missing. No one is killed. And the Japanese Pilots presumably are mostly either MIA or KIA because they were flying over a hostile base and we were flying over a friendly base. Them's is 1944 numbers. Goddamn right, Anaris. The Great Rangoon Turkey Shoot. All right, we now have four, five pilots with seven kills. No one has cracked T. Cole's eight kills as the leading ace of the war on the Allied side, although he is dead. Has been for a while. Um, But we've got four guys vowing for it. We've got uh, a Dutchman, uh, Van Harlem, who's been withdrawn from the front line and put into reserve. Uh, He's got seven kills. B.D. Wagner in the first AVG. These guys are all in the first AVG squadron. So these are all flying. I don't think they're all flying or were flying P-40s. Because they'd be in the second squadron if they weren't. But all these guys in the AVG, that's the American Volunteer Group. You've got B.D. Wagner, C.H. Older, uh, Greg Boynton, so Pappy Boynton, R.H. Smith, and you've got some additional aces down here as well. We just need to hide in the barrel like the Wiley Fish. <laughs> um, in terms of ships sunk, we didn't claim any Japanese losses. We did lose one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of the AKLs. Let's take a look at Rangoon. So the task force lost, what, six of the AKLs. There are six remaining. Three of them have suffered, you know, meaningful damage. One of them, I would, two of them, I would say is critical. The Kini and the Krom, or Coromel, both look like they're very badly damaged. The wear has moderate damage, and then the Kaldon, Neguda, and Namyung all have sort of negligible damage. We're going to dock them. They have a total of 3,900 supply left on board, so we're going to dock them and try and unload them and get that supply into the base. 4,000 supply isn't much, but every little bit of supply helps Rangoon. we got about 20,000 in Rangoon right now. Mole mine is at level 3 forts still. What's Pegu at? One, or three as well. Okay. Meanwhile, we've got three additional task forces that are on their way to Rangoon or in the area. We've got task force 327, which has two out of two detection. It's got two mine layers providing some escort, but they would not fare well against destroyers. Still, it's something. Um, bringing in about 10,000 supply. And then we've got Another task force over here with four ships, three of them transports, one mine layer providing support, or not mine layer, but a mine sweeper. Another 4,500 supply coming in that way. This guy's a three out of three detection. So 4,500 all told, that gives us about 15,000 supply on the way into Rangoon, although it is detected, which means the Japanese could try and interdict it. We are trying to provide some cover for uh, for the task forces, however, In the event that the Japanese try to bring another destroyer task force forward, we have deployed the U.S. heavy cruiser New Orleans and two destroyers, the Perkins and the Warden, to aid. The Perkins is a Mahan class, and the Warden is a Farragut class, so they're not even the obsolete four stackers. They're a little bit better than that. Crew quality is not tremendous, but, you know, it is what it is. Eight-inch guns on the heavy cruiser. That won't go 
against any larger Japanese task force, but the plan is to bring these guys to the west of Rangoon, just north of Rangoon, and prevent any Japanese raids. I don't know that I'm going to drive them into the port itself. We'll see. Japanese, meanwhile, have two destroyers here at Rangoon. No indication of other ships nearby at the moment, but at least a big part of their punching power is destroyed, and I doubt their destroyers have any real ammunition reserves left after all of that slugging. If we take a look at our, our pilot groups here, our most experienced pilot group or most experienced squadron is the AVG First Squadron. We take a look at the pilots here. You can see a number of them where you see green, they gained experience last turn. So quite a few of the, the even more experienced pilots gained it. But everybody's like 70 plus. This is probably by far our best, but certainly our best army squadron might be our best squadron altogether. Boynton, 84. Wagner, 83. Smith, 81. These guys know how to fly. Um, What about the other groups here? The Kitty Hawks, they were probably less experienced, right? They're not even based out of here. They were doing long-range cap out of Pegu. So this squadron is a bit more beat up. You can see they have like 50% of their aircraft are not serviceable from damage or whatever or maintenance. Uh, the group did gain quite a bit of experience, though. You can see these guys' experience levels much lower, only in the 40s and 50s, but quite a bit of experience gained for a lot of these different warrant officers. They're in the uh, Royal Canadian Air Force, so the Royal Canadian Air Force making a name for himself in the Battle of Rangoon. And then the other squadron here also gained quite a bit of experience. They're a little bit better. Everybody's above 50, a couple of guys in the 70s, but still. Another Royal Air Force, or Royal Canadian Air Force squadron. Their fatigue level is at 20. That's much higher than I would like to see it at. Usually I want crews to have less than 15 experience to heavily deploy them. Um, the hurricanes are absurdly high at 36, 20s. So we need, a, we need a day of rest for these crews. I am assuming the Japanese will give it to us after those horrific losses for their fighters. Um, I suppose they could send bombers out of Bangkok to try and hit our shipping in the port. But in my opinion, that would be a foolish thing to do after losing 40 fighters in a given turn. Um, so I, I would assume we will have at least one turn of breathing space before the, before the next battle, but we'll see. I'm sure after running cap for three, two days in a row over those ships, his, his pilots need a break as well. Um, not really anything that we've noticed has changed in China, so not really anything to focus on there. Lurkins, thanks for the follow. Radman, thanks for the follow. David Robert, thank you for the follow. Swirlpool, thank you for the follow. And a couple hours ago, Salty Snail as well. All right, so our groups here, their assault value is still surprisingly high. But the supply level at uh, Cleric Field is not great. The Philippines will probably fall in the next two to three weeks. Batavia is still chugging along with over 30,000 supply. Level three forts. And 963 assault value. The Prohoda garrison continues to be slowly brought in. It's got 25 rifle squads that are all ready for combat, which have been brought in from that other base. There are still another 28 uh, combat value left behind. They have not gotten there yet, but we are working on bringing them in. Um... Almost unloaded. Well, now we're working on unloading some fuel at Perth. And that's pretty much the main thing. We are unloading some fuel at Pago. We have some additional fuel on the way to Pago. And our Hornet is in port. Do we have anything working on repairs right now? California, Tennessee. Oh, that reminds me. 
Is the um, Prince of Wales ready for transit yet? Doesn't say she's repairing. One day. One day and then the Prince of Wales will be ready to move to England. To glorious old England. Where she will finish her repairs. Okay. We've got some ships loading up with fuel at Abaddon as well. Um, let's see here. How are those troops doing at the show? Are they on their way to Rangoon yet? I want to get the Chinese divisions here that have shown up. One more day of packing for each. Wondering if there's a buildup going on at Chiang Mai. It looks like there's an increase in number of units there, so it is possible that a buildup could be ongoing. It would make sense to me that he would he would try and launch one through the mountains there. The supply situation's not great, but he probably doesn't want to come head on straight up toward Mole Mine either. Um, oh yeah, how's that AVD? It didn't say it sank. Wow. So the Ballard took pretty heavy damage and disbanded into the port at Savi. It did take one Japanese torpedo and she's got 80 flood damage, 46 engine damage, 53 fighters, or not fighters, fires, and 61 systems. So she is not in good shape. Pretty much sunk. Her current cruise speed is limited to one knot, I believe. So not something that we're going to be able to really get her anywhere. The thought would be to perhaps pull her back to Pago where there's a protected anchorage because that is a level three fort, which means the Japanese wouldn't be able to attack ships in anchorage there. Um, it's pretty close, but I don't know that we would make it. I think we'd be better off trying to stabilize things in port right now and then heading there once we do. Sub time. Oh, thank you. For, that's what you meant. Thank you, Stein. Thanks for the sub. Beyond economic repair. Tell that to the Bunker Hill, Captain Flack. My favorite is the, I was at the Bunker Hill and I can't remember what the other I-6 class carriers were that, uh, were badly damaged late in the war, like nearly sunk. And they spent a vast amount of resources to basically get them back up to like brand new status so that they were in the best shape of any of the Essex class carriers. But then because they were in the best shape of any of the Essex class carriers, they didn't get used after the war. The Navy kind of husbanded them and they were like, well, if we want to do a conversion or an upgrade, like these are in the best material shape. And so we could, we could use them, but then because they were in the best material shape, they never wanted to use them and the upgrades never materialized. And so these guys like were in mint condition. And then eventually like 30 years later, they're like, Oh yeah, we're never going to use those. Those are obsolete. Now I guess we're going to scrap them. Yeah. Sad. Sad. It's kind of like, kind of like the, the Kaiser's fleet in world war one. Although they did use them quite a bit in World War One, but still like, oh, we don't want to risk losing them and they're in good shape. I don't know. All right. So got some mountain guns coming down into Burma. We've got two divisions of Chinese troops loading up on cargo trains at La Show and they're going to rail into Rangoon. I'm not sure there's a lot else to show this turn. Just making sure... Nothing new showed up that we weren't aware of. Mm. Yeah, I think I think we're good. So let's take a look at ship availability real quick. 
Nothing for the next couple days. In three days, we get a destroyer and some submarines. We get an escort carrier in a little over a week. And the Wasp in a little bit under a month, as well as the North Carolina. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, that's going to do it for this part of the stream. We're going to move on to a World War I game for the second part. I know this is a fairly short look at War in the Pacific, especially for as big of a turn as it was. But there's not a lot else to share. I mean, we had those big battles around Rangoon. We might have or we nearly destroyed a Japanese submarine, or not submarine, a destroyer. And we lost a few aircraft and they lost a bunch. So I've got to reorganize my camp patrols and things like that. But, um, you know, and I suppose you could try and bomb Rangoon, but I'm going to guess we'll have at least one to two days of, of calm before, before things pick back up. With that being said, I know this episode was a bit on the shorter end, but we're going to wrap up here. I hope you guys did enjoy this turn and this series. It was a great victory for us. Uh, we'll see how things play out next time. Until then, this is the Historical Gamer saying once again, thank you very much for watching. And until next time, I'm out.